Hi everyone, I'd like to walk through this whole um, finding the derivative function using the limit definition business uh, one time with a nice messy function. We are we should be getting really good at the algebra. Again, it sometimes will get slightly messier because we'll now have two variables. We're not plugging in a number ahead of time. So in this case, we have the z variable and it will still show up along with h. Uh, but I want to make sure that we see this, that no one gets thrown off by it. So if I give you a function m of z equals 1 over 3 times the square root of z, and I ask you to find m prime of z, the derivative function. So because this doesn't have a number in there already, that's telling me that this is asking me for a function. And I hopefully know that I'm supposed to go back to my limit definition and take the limit as h goes to 0 of m of z plus h, since z is our variable, minus m of z all over h. And do I want to sneak this? I think I'm going to move down the line right away. So when we go to plug that in, m of z plus h, I'm supposed to replace my input variable z with a z plus h. So this is our function evaluated just a little ways away from any given z value. And then we're supposed to subtract off m of z, which is just the original function. So this is our function evaluated right at our z. And then I'm supposed to divide by h. So again, this should be pretty familiar work. I did pick a nice messy one. This one has trouble with radicals and fractions, so we'll have to deal with both those things. Uh, and with that extra z in there, that'll also make it just a little messier. Instead of just having one variable, we'll have two. So you could probably try and tackle either fractions or radicals first, but I think I want to deal with fractions first. That to me looks like the easiest thing to get rid of right now. So if I want to clear fractions and fractions, to clear the first one, I need to multiply by a 3 times the square root of z plus h. Uh, and I'll have to do that to the bottom as well. You can't just do this to the top. Okay, and then, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to clear the second one, this won't cancel out the square root of z, but it will cancel out the 3. So really all I need is an additional square root of z. If you don't spot that you don't really need another 3 and you make this a 3z, it'll work. You'll get the right answer, so don't panic about that. But if you're paying attention, multiplying the first one by 3z will cancel out the denominator. Great. I'm sorry, multiplying the first one by 3 root z plus h. Multiplying the second one by that will cancel out the 3, but then you'll still need to cancel out the root z. Okay, do I think I can? I think I can actually squeeze this in right here. Okay, so I get, when I multiply the first term, and the distribute is the really important one, the 3 square root of z plus h will cancel with the 3 square root of z plus h, and all I'll be left with is the 1 on the top and the root z. So I get a root z. When I multiply the second one, that minus sign is going to carry through. The 3's will cancel, the root z's will cancel. I'll be left with the 1 times root z plus h. And then on the bottom, I'm going to have an uh, h and a 3. I'm going to rearrange order a little bit there. And then the root 3 plus h times root z, which you can just leave if you want to. Or again, I'm just going to do this to remind you that it's legal to do. You can, when you're multiplying two radicals, you can smush that into one radical and say I have a z. Uh, to change this to a 3, that's a z, and a z plus h under the radical. So whenever you're multiplying, you can put radicals together or take them apart across that multiplication. It doesn't work over addition, but it does over multiplication. Okay, and now that I worked so hard to fit that all on one line, I'm going to rewrite it anyways because I want you to be able to see what I do next. So I have a square root of z minus a square root of z plus h all over... 3h times the square root of z times z plus h. 
Okay, so I dealt with the fractions and fractions, which basically just pushes some of that denominator mess down to the bottom, but that's okay. I'm trying to simplify the top to the point where I can free up an H to cancel, right? This is my big problem right now, is that in any of these steps I've written, if I let H equal zero, I get zero in the denominator, and that's not okay. So now, in order to work towards freeing up that H, I need to get rid of the radicals. And the way to do that will be to multiply by the conjugate, root z plus root z plus h over root z plus root z plus h. So I've just made an even bigger mess in the bottom, but the top will start to simplify nicely for me. Okay, so I'm going to actually write out the bottom first. I have a 3h, I have a square root of z times z plus h. And I have a square root of z plus root z plus h. Okay, so that's my bottom. I pushed all sorts of mess into the bottom trying to clean up the top. And then on the top, I need to foil. So let's see if I can grab a color and show some of these. Okay, so here is my first. A root z times root z is just a z. So that's working out beautifully. My inside is this. So nothing particularly nice happens there. I have, oh, what am I doing? I'm skipping outside. Let's go ahead and do outside. Foil. Okay, so there's my outside. Uh, again, nothing particularly nice. I have a root z times a root z plus h, which you can just write like that, or because I've done it earlier in this problem, I'll do it again. You can mush those together, make it root z times z plus h. And then my inside, now the yellow one, is the same thing, but it has a minus out in front. And then my last, what color do I have still, is a root z plus h times a root z plus h. But again, it has this minus sign attached to it. So you want to be really careful here. It's minus z plus h. And if you drop those parentheses without distributing, you're going to be in trouble. Don't do it. Okay. So looking at this, the really nice thing happening is that the square root of z times z plus h goes away completely. We're subtracting those. Again, really avoid the temptation to try and cross this out. The top is all addition subtraction, so you can't cancel a term out of an addition subtraction. Division is canceling and it does not undo subtracting. Uh, actually, if we're looking closely, I can even cross out a little bit more than that. I can see that I'm going to end up with a z minus z, so that's going to be gone as well. The thing to be really careful about if you're doing this before you've distributed it is just to make sure that this minus sign gets distributed in. Okay, so we have the limit as h approaches zero of, I'm going to write out this whole bottom first. And then on the top, all we have left is a negative h. So we will get to cancel out the negative, or the h will be left with a negative 1 on top. So I think I'm ready to go ahead and take the limit if you can visualize that. So the h is gone. I have a negative 1 left on the top. On the bottom, I have the 3. I have, let's see what I have, h going to 0 and h going to 0. So I'll be left with a square root of z squared. And here I have square root of z plus square root of z, which is two square root z's. So I'm seeing a negative 1 over 6. And then square root of z squared, this is kind of a funny one. This is actually the absolute value of z times the square root of z. I probably wouldn't pick on you super hugely if you forgot that that was an absolute value, but it is a good thing to be aware of. Um, you can plug negative z's in here, but you're not going to get back negative z's because you square them and it eliminates the sign. What you'll get back is the same number with no negative sign. Okay. 
So there was a really messy algebraically determine the limit function. I'm sorry, determine the derivative function using the limit definition. So this is my m prime of z, and it will input the same z values the function did, but it will not output y values, it will output slopes. So if I now ask you for m prime of 4, you should just be able to use your equation and say it's negative 1 over 6 times absolute value of 4 is 4, times the square root of 4, which is 2. So I have 24, 48. I have negative 1 over 48. And remember, what that's telling me is that when z equals 4 for my original function, the slope of my tangent line will be negative 1 over 48. So that's a really shallow negative slope. And then, oh, sorry for the wiggle. The last part of this is to put this all together and find the equation for a tangent line. So we already know that the slope, I'm not going to write m because that was my function's name, is negative 148. We know that our z value, which is like our x here, is 4. And if we want a y value to go with that, we have to go all the way back to the original function, not the derivative. It'll give me slopes. The original function will give me y. And I'll get 1 over 3 times the square root of 4, which is 2. So my y value is 1 sixth. And when I put that all together, y minus 1 sixth equals my slope times x minus 4, oh, z minus 4 in this one. So y is equal to negative 1 48th z minus plus 1 12th plus 1 6. So the negative 1 48th times negative 4 becomes positive 1 12th. And then I'm adding the 1 6 from the other side which is actually going to be 2 twelfths. So I get y equals here, 2 twelfths. y equals negative 1 over 48 oh, z. Hold on, let me go back to this. This is 2 twelfths, which means when I add, I have 3 twelfths. Sorry, trying to do too many writing downs at once, which actually reduces really nicely. 3 twelfths is the same as 1 fourth. So there is the equation for my tangent line. And again, your calculator will check these for you really nicely. So make sure you show me all that work. And I do not want to see any decimals in something like this. The only time I would want to see decimals is if the problem started with them or if you're working on a word problem and you want to give that approximate answer that's a little easier to make sense of. All right. Thanks for watching.